Grace to you and peace in the name of our risen Lord, Jesus Christ. Welcome to this worship video produced for First Presbyterian Church in Bluefield, West Virginia for Sunday, April 19th, 2020. I'd like to begin with a couple of announcements. First, I wanna say thank you. Thank you so much to the many of our members who have continued to send in their pledges and offerings. We know that times are tight and that our current economic picture looks pretty grim, but because of your continued support and generous giving, the church has been able to pay its bills and to support our staff. And so we wanna say thank you. On a related note, because we were unable to gather for Easter Sunday morning, we did not take up the one great hour of sharing offering this year. This offering is taken up annually by the Presbyterian Church at the denominational level. It's designated for programs like Presbyterian Disaster Assistance and the Presbyterian Hunger Relief Program. And given our current season, these programs are helping more than ever. So those of you who feel led to give, please send that offering to the church designated for one great hour of sharing so that we can continue in our ministry and mission to help our neighbors. I'd also like to announce that this week we will begin our new Bible study series. We'll be taking a look at Paul's epistle to the Romans so you will find reflection questions sent out in the weekly letter from the church. And those who would like to gather to discuss those questions, I will be hosting a Zoom event on Thursday evening at 6.30. This will be sent out to your inbox the same way that the Sunday morning Zoom invitation is sent. On that note, I hope that to see many of you on Zoom this morning and perhaps some of you will even dress up because my final announcement is a reminder that today is Holy Humor Sunday. For centuries, in, beginning in the Middle Ages, the first Sunday after Easter was celebrated in Germany and in other churches in Eastern Europe as Bright Sunday. This was before April Fool's Day became a real holiday, but this was an event where people in churches would play practical jokes on one another, would tell funny stories. Joy and laughter was celebrated in the spirit of saying that when the devil had come to the tomb that morning and found it empty, God had played the greatest practical joke of them all in resurrecting Jesus. Now this tradition faced some setbacks in the 17th century, many popes and our rather infamous stern Protestant ancestors um, dismissed this tradition as frivolity and irreverence. But within the last century, it's found new life in the liturgical renewal movement. And so many churches today are celebrating holy humor, bright Sunday. So we invite you to open your heart and let in a little laughter, express a little joy, this morning as we celebrate together. We'd like to begin with a time for our young disciples, those who are young at heart, and all of us beloved children of God. Let us open with story time from Jillian. Hello and welcome to our program. I am your host, Jillian the Librarian. Today we will be reading excerpts from a most beloved classic novel, Fox and Socks by Dr. Seuss. Let us begin. Let's have a talk about Tweedle Beetles. What do you know about Tweedle Beetles? Well, when Tweedle Beetles fight, it's called a Tweedle Beetle battle. And when they battle in a puddle, it's a Tweedle Beetle puddle battle. And when Tweedle Beetles battle with paddles in a puddle, they call it a Tweedle Beetle puddle paddle battle. And
When beetles battle beetles in a puddle paddle battle, and the beetle battle puddle is a puddle in a bottle, they call this a tweedle beetle bottle puddle paddle battle muddle. And when beetles fight these battles in a bottle with their paddles, and the bottle's on a poodle and the poodle's eating noodles, they call this a muddle puddle tweedle poodle beetle noodle bottle paddle battle. And Now wait a minute, Mr. Socks Fox. When a fox is in the bottle, where the Tweedle Beetles battle, with their paddles in a puddle on a noodle eating poodle, this is what they call a Tweedle Beetle Noodle Poodle Bottle Paddle Muddle Duddle Fuddle Waddle Fox in Socks, sir. Fox and Socks, our game is done, sir. Thank you for a lot of fun, sir. The end. I hope you enjoyed today's reading of the Tweedle Beetle Battle from the book Fox and Socks by Dr. Seuss. Tune in again next week when we read The Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky. Not boring. This is my joke for Holy Humor Sunday. A father was reading Bible stories to his young son. He read, The man named Lot was warned to take his wife and flee out of the city, but his wife looked back and was turned into a pillar of salt. His son asked, Well, what happened to his flea? Are you there? Live from the Snyder's house in Brush Fork, West Virginia, it is joke time for Holy Sunday. Quick griping about the church. If it was perfect. If it was perfect, <laughs> you couldn't be here. <laughs> That's funny, Randy, I swear. People are funny. They want the front of the bus, the middle of the road, and the back of the church. <laughs> <laughs>
One of the great blessings of Holy Humor Sunday is that it serves as a reminder to not take ourselves too seriously. While yes, the good news of the gospel is about serious life and death business, we sometimes get so wrapped up in our reverence for this book that we love that we forget that the scriptures are supposed to be funny. They're entertaining and lighthearted. And some of that gets lost. But when you slow down and consider the satire in the story of Jonah, the only prophet who does not want a word from the Lord, or when you think about the hyperbolic exaggeration in the Purim narrative of Esther, Haman has to build a gallows for Mordecai, but not just anyone, one that's 150 feet in the air. Some of it gets lost in translation. These ancient texts that were supposed to be memorized in their original Hebrew are often a little like nursery songs. They rhyme and they play with language. Hebrew loves a good pun. And perhaps the most comedic of all of the scriptures are the parables that Jesus tells. Just like a really good joke, he rarely explains them because when you do that, it loses all of its punch. The parables were supposed to be stories that subverted expectations. The kingdom of God is not going to be the way that you expect, and that is where the seed of all comedy comes from. The unexpected, the outrageous. And perhaps none of the parables more perfectly embodies this than Luke 15, the parable of the prodigal father. This has always been one of my favorite parables. When I was in seminary, I was taking a class and I chose this parable to do extensive research and exegetical writing on. And as I was up on the third floor of the seminary library, tucked into the corner, reading the asterisk from a footnote from a commentary, I found this note that said one of the Greek derivatives of the instruments played at the party could have been an ancient form of the bagpipe. And I included that in my paper, mostly because I thought it was hilarious, even if it was unlikely. Sadly, my professor didn't see it that way, which is a shame because we lose something when we take out the Bible's sense of humor. Think about this parable a minute, like it was a sitcom in New York or you have a good Jewish family whose son has wandered off, and when he comes back, what do you expect? You expect a mother to say, I told you so. What is wrong with you? Why can't you go find a good woman instead of all of those crazies from out in the country? But no, you would expect a stern parent. Jesus' audience was expecting the older brother to take the younger one to task. But what does Jesus give them? This gracious image of a father running down the road, full out, wild abandon. That's why I call the parable that of the prodigal father. Prodigal meaning lavish and unrestrained. This is the love and grace that is the good gospel message. So I invite you with a joyful heart to hear this story again from the book that we love. And Jesus said to him, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. And a few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his property in dissolute living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that land 
and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed his pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. But then he came to himself and he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare? And here I am dying of hunger? I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be your son. Treat me like a hired hand. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still a far way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost, but now he's found and they all began to celebrate. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. A small town had four churches, Presbyterian, Methodist, Catholic, and Baptist. All four had a serious problem with squirrels in the church. Each church, in its own fashion, had a meeting to deal with the problem. The Presbyterians decided it was predestined that squirrels be in the church and that they would just have to live with them. The Methodists decided they should deal with the squirrels lovingly in the style of Charles Wesley. They humanely trapped them and released them in a park at the edge of town. Within three days, the squirrels were all back in the church. The Catholics also humanely trapped them and attempted to teach them the rhythm method, which of course did not work. The Baptists had the best solution. They voted the squirrels in as members. Now they only see them at Christmas and Easter. One Sunday morning, the pastor noticed little Alex was staring up at the large plaque that hung in the foyer of the church. The plaque was covered with names, and small American flags were mounted on either side of it. The seven-year-old had been staring at the plaque for some time, so the pastor walked up, stood beside him, and said quietly, Good morning, Alex. Good morning, pastor, replied the young man, still focused on the plaque. Pastor, what is this? Alex asked. Well, it's a memorial to all the men and women who have died in the service. Soberly, they stood together, staring at the large plaque. Little Alex's voice was barely audible when he finally managed to ask, which one, the nine o'clock or the 10.30 service? <laughs> I now invite you to join me in our prayers for the people. Let us pray. Gracious God, giver of life and joy and laughter, we praise you this morning for these gifts, for the moments of unbridled cheer that you grant us, for opportunities to laugh at ourselves, for the giggles of children, for friends and family who love us for our quirks rather than in spite of them for artists that give us the opportunity to see the world through the surreal and absurd, for the courage to smile even in the face of difficulty, for beloved saints who overflow with hope and have shared your joy with all of us. 
for the words of Jesus that defy our logical minds, for teaching us that we can be born from above, for the woman who turns the house upside down to find a coin and celebrates with all of her neighbors, for the generosity of a landowner who will pay a full day's wage for an hour's worth of work, for tiny seeds of faith that can move mountains, and for the father who is willing to look like a fool as he sprints down the road to meet his son. For the great reversal of the gospel, that the last will be first, that the rejected stone will lay the foundation, that those who wish to be great must become servants, and that the lost will be found. Gracious God, we thank you for all of these rich and abundant blessings. And we thank you most for the life and joy that lets us laugh at the most astounding truth of all, that the tomb is empty because Christ has conquered death and the light shines so bright that it overcomes the darkness. For all these things, thanks be to God. Alleluia. Amen. I invite you to sing together. Our closing hymn is number 157, if you have your hymnal, I Danced in the Morning.
The psalmist reminds us that those who sow seeds while they weep will reap a harvest of joy. They shall come home shouting, carrying their sheaves. It is in that spirit that I charge you now to go with laughter. Go in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, now and forever, giving you joy and abundant life. Amen. So I invite you to participate with me. Wherever you are, gather some candles, or perhaps go around and turn on all the lights in the house. And as we walk through the story, extinguish 